Welcome back to the lab. Our PFC isn't isolated. That could be a big problem down the road. That risk factor doesn't make our power factor correction circuitry any less a great idea for our architecture though. Rather than abandoning PFC outright, let's finish what we started. Today we're going to put a capstone on our PFC design by selecting all of the supporting components to complement our custom inductors, our controller, to complete our 2400 watt PFC. When we left off our PFC design, we were using a homebrew approximated PFC and LT spice. However, I bent to my desire of using the manufacturer release simulation model, fought my way into Tina TI, and downloaded the example simulation file. After pulling my component values into their base simulation, things looked pretty good, well, at first, when operating at a 1 amp load with 70 microfarads of bulk, which was already 10 times more output capacitance than we expected to be necessary, more on that later, well, here's what we saw. This is what we saw when we pulled around 390 watts out of the PFC. There's one massive problem standing out to me. This PFC is doing a terrible job. It is not doing a great job of power factor correction at all. The power factor doesn't look great. In my opinion, that current waveform is outright nasty. I think that our unintelligent fixed duty cycle boost converter was doing a better job than this. Gross. We see a fair bit of voltage ripple, but that's kind of power for the course when working with AC to DC conversion. Zero crossings are a harsh reality we need to tolerate, and we might need to ride through those in a different way than I first expected. Petty complaints aside, the simulation looks good enough that it might be working correctly, and honestly, I'm not sure if any part of what we're seeing is due to the average mode model being used. Perhaps the average model of this PFC controller just picks a fixed duty cycle and doesn't truly perform the power factor correction algorithm. Well, if that's the case, then our simulation result makes a lot of sense. But if that's how the system truly performs, if this is really what we're going to see, and I think it might be, I'm thinking we're going to need to make our own control loop running in a microcontroller if we really want true power factor correction. Alright, so the simulation's running and that's great, but 390 watts is not the goal, so let's move on. Maintaining our 70 microfarads of bulk and changing the output load to 2400 watts shows us clearly that our output capacitance isn't even close to sufficiently large. The PFC is going hard, trying as hard as it can to regulate output voltage, but it just can't. We're seeing a voltage range between 412 and 295 volts. That's 30% peak to peak voltage ripple. Yikes. That's our whole voltage range for all four daughter cards. Yeah, that's that's not going to work. This means that either our simulation is not running correctly, the calculations we did are incorrect, or we didn't understand how the PFC controller will truly operate while performing its function. That's something that I'll need to look into. In the meantime, let's find a quantity of output capacitance that would be acceptable according to the simulation. We can use that number in our paper calculations to know if we've corrected the discrepancy between our paper calculations and the simulation. And well, that new output capacitance value was found to be 560 microfarads. Would you look at that? Our voltage range is now between 284 and 370 volts with an equally ugly input current waveform as we were seeing before. But hey, at least the simulation is reporting a voltage ripple of 4% now with 2400 watts coming out of the PFC. That looks better. Now I think this is going to be workable, but we might need to expand that valid voltage range for each daughter card, or cascade a power fail signal through our cards to signal the next one to kick in when the previous ones failed. Um, not exactly sure what this will turn into, but I'm thinking that we're going to need something rather than relying purely on the voltage falling below a threshold. Yeah, with a range between 390 and 370 volts, this is going to be a little tricky. Something just doesn't quite add up with the waveforms that I'm seeing, so I plotted one more set of variables. The current through one leg of our boost and the current through both boost phases. I want to make sure that we aren't failing to regulate voltage and resulting in some current surging through those rectifier diodes because our output voltage is really close to our peak mains voltage. Adding these two current signals reveals something pretty strange. It appears that the current is switching most of the time, but just stops. This could indicate misconfiguration of the current sense inputs to our switch room power supply controller, among other things. Not really a fan of these simulation models, the controller's missing a pin based on the datasheet, the ideal boost stages 
feel a little hand wavy to me. I'd really prefer to run a true transient simulation rather than use models with so many assumptions behind them. If moving forward with the UCC 28070 controller is going to be a real thing, and it might, we need to learn more about this part and the simulation. Looks like I'll be getting in touch with some of TI's apps engineers, or be finding a suitable replacement. This PFC controller may not be configured correctly, doesn't appear to be performing very well, and isn't very easy to work with in a simulation tool. I guess I'm just starting to see less value in sticking with this controller. If the current waveform we're seeing now is really what this controller is going to generate, I think we'll be much better off with an offline switcher. The offline switcher will give similar power factor to what we're seeing in our simulation now, but at significantly reduced cost and complexity. If a true power factor corrected input is required, then I think we might need to roll another control loop on a microcontroller already. We've already got two of them, so what's one more? I suppose we should probably talk about the supporting components that we chose as well, not just the controller. Inductors, FETs, diodes, well, we've got a few of these to talk through, so I'll try to be brief. The input capacitance was selected to be two microfarads. We don't really need input capacitance on this converter since we're sourced by mains and there's plenty of voltage to go around, but this probably ends up behaving more like a filter cap than bulk anyways. Regardless, we have two microfarads here and mains will handle the rest. I doubt we'll be pushing mains voltage around much. This is provided by two one microfarad film caps and if we assume they have a series resistance of around 25 milliohms, they will certainly be dissipating some power. I expect there'll be approximately 2.8 amps of ripple current on these capacitors, which leads to a power dissipation of approximately 0.2 watts. Seems pretty reasonable to me, only 0.1 watt per capacitor. We also selected our rectifier diode. We choose the RFN20 NS6 SFHTL from Rome. This is a fast recovery diode rated for 20 amps RMS and 600 volts. With a forward voltage of only 0.9 volts at 10 amps, I expect this diode will be dissipating around 9 watts when operating under full load, leading to a temperature rise no less than 22 degrees. More likely than not, the temperature rise will be much closer to 50 degrees with typical thermal solution. While 50 degrees will make this part a little warm, that shouldn't be a problem given the maximum junction temperature rating of this component, 150 C. Again, that was with 9 watts of power dissipation in the diode. Great, our output inductor is next. We discussed this component in a fair bit of detail in our last video. Check that out if you're interested in custom inductor design. I think it was pretty cool and we talked about design assistance that might help you save a lot of time. We just designed this inductor to balance the physical size, cost, and performance. The best compromise we found results in dissipating approximately 6 watts of power while operating at full load, and this is because we're moving forward with the gapped core design for now, the gapped E-core. And I'm doing that because I think it'll be easier to gap an E-core in our lab rather than making a precise cut in a toroid, and it might end up being cheaper for TDK to give us a gapped E-core variant as well. If it's easier for us, I'm guessing it'll be easier for them too. The current sense transformers are meant to be the Coilcraft CS4050V01L. This transformer features a primary side resistance of 1 milliohm, a 10 amp rating, and a 50 to 1 turns ratio. For our application, this leads to an estimated power consumption of 0.1 watts. As we discussed a little while ago, there was some analysis required to ensure volt second balance will always be present while sensing current, and that was a critical part of this component selection. Unfortunately, I don't feel like we have enough time to dive into all of that today. There's still a lot more to talk about, but let me know in the comments if you'd like to talk more about current sense transformers or current sensing in a future video. Our next target is the switching MOSFET. We chose the... <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm not even going to try with this one. We chose this MOSFET from Infineon. This thing is a rock star and super cool. I'm actually a huge fan of this package. This footprint is like two D-pack transistors back to back and merged into one with the thermal pad on top of the component instead of the bottom. Cool stuff. Well, yeah, literally cool stuff because this construction allows for minimized thermal impedance from this part to our heatsink. We don't need to sync it through a PCB first. No complaints from me. These beasts have a 650 volt rating, can handle a continuous current of 23 amps, heat sinking allowed, and have a maximum series resistance of 0.34 ohms at 10 amps with a gate drive voltage of 10 volts. This leads to a sweet 34 watts of power dissipated in the package. To prevent this part from overheating, we'll need a case to ambient thermal solution that can achieve less than 1.62 degrees C per watt. 
Yikes. Yeah, that's going to be a beefy heatsink and a lot of airflow. There's definitely some room for improvement here, but thermal monitoring of this heatsink will allow us to prevent permanent damage to our FETs due to thermal overload. After all, if we need to switch over to backup power occasionally so these FETs can cool down, that isn't going to be the end of the world. I'll say that we found a solution. It's not the best solution, but without putting a full desktop CPU cooler on top of these parts, I really don't know if we're going to be able to keep them cool. That's a problem for another day. Thermal design will be a whole beast in itself, but electrically, we have a part that should work. We might need to switch this out later, but that's okay. Last but certainly not least, output capacitance. We designed the output capacitance such that no more than 7 amps of ripple current will occur on the output. Unfortunately, while this is within the specs of the 7 microfarad capacitor, we failed to consider how much ripple voltage this would induce, according to our simulation, at least. Using our equation that we used before, current equals the capacitance multiplied by the change in voltage over the change in time. Rearranging that to be current multiplied by the change in time divided by the capacitance equals the change in voltage leads us to an unfortunate truth. While nothing would be overstressed, the ripple voltage while operating 80% duty cycle at 100 kilohertz should be eight volts, which is bizarre because we're seeing more than 30 volts of ripple in our simulation. Hmm. After looking through our calculations again, I just can't make sense of it. Perhaps we're not considering the holdup required when the mains waveform amplitude becomes too low to boost effectively. Perhaps I'm making a math error or there's an invalid assumption in my calculation of ripple current. I simply haven't figured out exactly where the error is stemming from, whether the error is in the simulation or my calculation, but I really need to get this figured out before we can move forward. Regardless, if we assume, if only for now, that our calculated ripple current is correct and the simulation is wrong, I expect that the power dissipated in our output film capacitor should be approximately half a watt. Considering all of these components together and multiplying by two for the two phases of our boost converter, where necessary, I expect that there will be around 100 watts of loss in our PFC when 2400 watts is flowing through it. That's an efficiency of 96%. Not bad. Two thirds of these losses originate from our FETs, so there's definitely some room for improvement here, but I believe that we've arrived at what I'll call a functional design. The mess of calculations is starting to turn into a solution. Over the last few videos, we've been digging into this PFC, determining the correct compensation and programming component values for the PFC controller. With that done, we moved on to designing the custom boost inductors and selecting some other components for the PFC boost. Our UPS is really coming together and I think that we're pretty far along with this PFC design. That means it's time to either resolve the couple open questions we have with the UCC 28070 PFC controller or use an offline switcher instead of this PFC. If the simulation is correct, then this PFC controller isn't doing a great job of power factor compensation or power factor correction. That's a problem. Will this require a custom switch with power supply controller? Does an off-the-shelf solution exist? Well, I'm not sure right now, but if you want to be the first to know, then subscribe to be notified of our future videos where we will find a way to establish a neutral referenced inverter output and establish a switch mode power supply transformer capable of establishing 5000 volt isolation from primary to secondary. I think this power factor correction is great, totally worth the hassle, and it feels amazing to have this design so close to complete. If you think so too, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, finding us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!